For today's poem of the day, um, we will be reading from Isaac Watts. Um, in this section, he took uh, the second part of Psalm 111 and rewrote it um, so that it rhymes in English. He did it thus. The perfections of God. Great is the Lord, his works of might demand our noblest songs. Let his assembled saints unite their harmony of tongues. Great is the mercy of the Lord, he gives his children food. And ever mindful of his word, he makes his promise good. His son, the great redeemer, came to seal his covenant sure. Holy and reverend is his name, his ways are just and pure. They that would grow divinely wise must with his fear begin. Our fairest proof of knowledge lies in hating every sin. Um, whatever you may think of the message, uh, I wanted to kind of look at the technical uh, aspects of what it takes to transpose not just a translated poem, but a poem that when translated from the, because it, it was obviously the original poem was in Hebrew, is then translated to English, um, specifically to older-ish English, um, after having been translated from the Latin and then into German um, and so forth. So this is a poem that's undergone um, translations and and then he's then transcribing the poem into a more lyrical poem that I think is easier perhaps in his mind um, for people to understand within their um, cultural context. Um, that's my understanding anyway. Um, do you think, as far as um, translation goes, as far as the um, uh, aspects of maintaining the truth of a work goes, uh, or true to a work, because translation is an art of itself. Um, it's No matter how you translate anything, you're always going to be adding a little bit of yourself to it as you try to maintain um, as close to the original source as possible. So, uh, which is why in some, so like in, in Islam, you can't even translate the Quran. If you translate the Quran, it is then no longer the true Quran. Um, and there are multiple, uh, tr there are some translations of the Bible actually that um, do strive to be literal. Those are um, essentially called the literal translations. The English Standard Version is one of those. Um, New American Standard Version also. Uh, while there are others that um, kind of fully admit to having been very transcribed. The NIV is one of those where in order to impart their understanding of the meaning, they didn't, it wasn't a word-for-word -word translation. They didn't try to keep it word-for-word. -word. Um, they just tried to share what they thought was the message. Same, um, the uh, King James Version is notorious for this. Um, or I shouldn't say notorious, but there was um, a lot of artistic license taken uh, with that. Um, which in uh, so when you're translating any kind of work, be it religious or be it a poem from another language, um, what is your theory of translation? Are you going to are you participating in that artwork with the artist, uh, original artist, or and is the goal to make the meaning most known most clearly, or are you trying to? Um, be as close to the original meaning as possible without adding any of your own, um, even if it may make it then harder to read or understand. Um, I personally think that for religious works or works where you're, or scientific works, works where you're trying to deal with something that may be highly debatable, a word for word translation is better. For poetic works, um, the meaning I think and the lyrical beauty of the passage, um, like translating Pablo Neruda, for example, from the Spanish, I think the lyrical beauty and the ultimate meaning is going to be more important than whether or not there's a turn of phrase that's um, off. But what do you think? So that's the first point of discussion I wanted to raise. The second is I wanted to compare um, from a literal uh, version here, um, and that has um, some of the original Hebrew in it. I wanted to compare two different ones, one that has a little bit of the original Hebrew in it, and then one of them um, that has the, uh, and then, and then, so you can compare it to the poem that you just heard. Um, so this is the same second half of Psalm 
111. Let's see, going back to the. Oh, Psalm 111, part 2, where Isaac Watts was. Songs and food. So we'll start there. Hmm. It's hard to know which one is part two in this guy. Because, okay, so this is, um, this is what it is. I think he's went from verse four onward. So this is the ESV, which is a um, word for word translation of the poem. And so you can hear the changes in the poetic style. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. So again, the much shorter version by Isaac Watts. Great is the Lord, his works of might demand our noblest songs. Let his assembled saints unite their harmony of tongues. Um, great is the mercy of the Lord, he gives his children food. And ever mindful of his word, he makes his promise good. His son, the great Redeemer, came to seal his covenant sure. Holy and reverend is his name. His ways are just and pure. They that would grow divinely wise must with his fear begin. Our fairest proof of knowledge lies in hating every sin. So now you see there's actually a significant amount of interpretation um, between this kind of transliteration of this poem. Um, Hebrew poem was one of the big things that was done in older Hebrew literature was... Um, essentially this repetition, a point that is important, you repeat it and rephrase it in a different way, um, which is why it's significantly longer in the more transliterated, in the more literal translation. Um, so, and, and you'll see there's more reflection, right? He's caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. And then again, there's repetition. He's shown the people the power of his works, right? So there's this repeated theme, um, and it's actually a much more complicated poem, even as it's translated to English, um, because of that, because you have the aspect of repetition, and then you also have the theme where the beginning of multiple stanzas, each is the works, the works over here, the works over here, the works over here. Um, there was also a um, significant amount of interpretation right at the end with he sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Um, it's interpreted in a very messianic light with, um, and this poem uh, most likely was intended with a messianic poem, as a messianic poem. There was always, um, in ancient Hebrew, a lot of, of, you know, in and still is in modern um, Judaism, like this hope of this, there's something else, right? There's a redemption that's been sent, that's coming. A, a kepora is the Hebrew word, right? Um, but Watts goes ahead um, and just drops it out. He says, his son, the great redeemer, came to seal his covenant, sure. Um, to kind of state, you know, who he thinks the Messiah is. So um, in that way, it most likely makes it a lot easier for children or for um, his readers to understand um, he does, so he has inter he has a significant amount of interpretation. He also shortens it significantly um, because in English, repetition is not, uh, especially at that time, a big aspect of poetry, right? So that's changed. Um, and of course, I know, I'm sure Watts was not intending to be, you know, some a replacement for us with um, the, the Bible. I think he was trying to teach... Um, his way. I think it's just a very interesting um, thing to look at, to look at how um, how poetry changes through teaching, right? If you're using, if you're trying to teach essentially an older poem, 
and then you're rewriting it as your interpretation of the poem. You could additionally rewrite an interpretation of Watts' interpretation, right? And you could go from there and see what, um, you know, how your meaning or how your, uh, how your stanzas change based on your style, which may be a different, uh, it may be different, it may be much, uh, very changed lyrically. So I, I thought that was kind of an interesting point to bring up is um, how translations and transliterations and then interpretations change poetry. Um, here is one that has more, um, more Hebrew sprinkled throughout it. Praise Hashem. I'll praise Hashem with Kol Levav in the sob of the Yeshachim in the Eda. The Masei Hashem or Gedolim, Derushim of all them that have delighted therein. His Baal is glorious and majestic, and his silica endures forever. He hath caused his niflaot to be remembered. Hashem is Chanun and Rachum. You see, like with the Hebrew also, when you get a little of the Hebrew, you get the, this repetition of sound, these partial words, right? Um, these partial rhymes, sorry, um, that you wouldn't have gotten in English. Hashem is Chanun and Rachum. He hath given food unto them that fear him. He will be mindful of his brit lolam. He hath shown his people the koach of his works, that he may give them the nachalat goyim. The words of his, the works of his hands are emes and mishpat, while his pikulim are neemanim. See how there's that, there's this sound repetition. You actually start to discover that actually in the original there was a little bit of rhyme. Um, they stand fast, lad lolam, and are done in emes and yashar. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath ordained his brit lolam. And there you see, with the words brit lolam, the covenant forever, you actually are more able to recognize the repetition of sounds than in the way that it's done in English. Um, he hath ordained his brit lolam, kalosh and nora ishmo. Again, now you have the repeated ah vowels, and you have now this the way that the stanza ends also um, is more sudden, right? And 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 kadosh kind of reflects off of shmo, right? The fear of Hashem is the rashid chokma. Sechel tov have all they that live by it. His tehila endureth forever. Um, it also changes a little bit its context within the Book of Psalms when you know that tehilim is the title of the book in Hebrew, right? Um, so his tehillah endureth forever, his praise endureth forever. You actually start seeing that this is a collection of tehillim, right? So um, there's definitely there's definitely some evolution, right? From now again, the ESV is a little, is like very literal, so it gets very close. Um, you essentially have that same format um, as you do in the Hebrew, but then you miss the sound poetry, right? How does the sound of a language, so this is my next question for you to kind of analyze below, how does the sound of a language change its poetry, right? What is lost or what is um, gained even culturally, right? As we change poems into multiple different cultures, are we then gaining many different sound interpretations? You know, even if we maintain the meaning exactly the same, like the ESV does, you know, word, 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 word. Um, are we then, what are we losing with the sound? Does the sound itself have a kind of meaning, right? Um, or what are we gaining with different interpretations of the sound? So something to think about as you're looking at sounds in poetry. Um, so those are the kind of points to talk about. Um, how, what is your theory of translation, transliteration? Uh, when is it appropriate to uh, interpret? When is it not appropriate to interpret, depending on the context of what you're creating? I assume also for like medical literature, you wouldn't want to be interpreting. You want to be as close to the original <laughs> as possible. Um, and when is, when is sound a factor? And what are things that you have to take into um, consideration when you're trying to teach a much more complicated work of art to a um, perhaps less educated populace? Where are you going to go? Do you transliterate it? How do you change it? Um, is there, 
what, what are the derivative works going to add or take away? Um, so some kind of interesting thoughts just on the theory of poems. Um, so please feel free to discuss. Thank you.